Good afternoon. I'm Adrian Dix, BC Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our daily uh, COVID-19 briefing. We're honored to be the, here on the territories of the Lekwungen-speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. As you know, tomorrow we'll be issuing a written statement at about 3 o'clock to give you the information of the day. And that Friday morning, and it will be here at this podium at 11 a.m., but there will be a technical briefing for media before that. We'll be presenting some uh, an update to, to modeling that we've done about COVID-19 in British Columbia. And with that, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Henry. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, the update on COVID-19 in BC for today, April 15th. We have 44 new cases uh, that have been diagnosed in the last uh, day in BC, bringing our total of people with um, positive for COVID-19 COVID in BC to 1,561. That includes 670 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 623 in the Fraser Health Region, 92 on Vancouver Island Health, 146 people in the Interior Health Region, and 30 people in the Northern Health Region. We have no new long-term care facility outbreaks, but there are ongoing outbreaks at 21 long-term care and assisted living facilities in uh, Fraser Health in Vancouver Coastal. And currently we're up to 265 cases associated with those outbreaks. We also have an ongoing outbreak in uh, uh, a nursery in the interior health and we have three additional cases who have tested positive in that outbreak, bringing the, the total number with uh, uh, test positive in that uh, cluster to 26. We continue to have the single case at the Okanagan Correctional Facility and ongoing management of that uh, facility is, is going. As well, we uh, are now up to 48 cases associated with the Mission Federal uh, Correctional Facility in the Fraser Valley. Um, including seven people from that facility who are hospitalized in, in hospital here in British Columbia. Of, uh, of the cases we have, 131 people are hospitalized and of those, 59 people are in critical care or ICU in the province. We have unfortunately another three deaths um, in the last day here in British Columbia to bring our total of people who have died from COVID-19 to 75. That includes, for the first time, uh, a death in the interior health region, a man in his 60s who uh, had been in, in recovery at home. Um, 955 people are now fully recovered from COVID-19 here in British Columbia. I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing, the hard work we've been doing to ensure the needs uh, of all communities across the province have been addressed when it comes to preparing for and being able to respond effectively to cases of COVID-19. We recognize and have recognized from the beginning that every community is unique and they have different needs, both health care needs, um, essential service needs, and they require different levels of support. And particularly our smaller communities and more remote and First Nations communities may have limited res uh, resources and services, makes it much more challenging to address COVID-19, both in preventing it from entering those communities and responding. We know this, uh, this is especially great in some of our uh, more remote and, and First Nations communities. One thing that we do all have in common across the province and has been driving our response to this, this uh, pandemic is that we share our, our understanding and the value of our elders and seniors. And that is why we have been paying so much attention to what we can do to best protect them and to protect all of those who are more vulnerable to more severe illness around the province. So resources are being re, um, created to support communities around the province, provide them with the resources they need. And importantly, um, we talked about some of the testing strategies that we have, and we have been able to deploy testing um, to better support uh, our communities, our more remote and uh, uh, indigenous communities around the province. And that's something that I think is going to be incredibly important for us to be able to detect cases early, to detect clusters of cases, and and to appropriately and safely manage um, in these communities. 
One of the other things that has come to my attention in the last little while is that there have been concerns, and I've mentioned this before, that people are fearful of going into hospital or seeking medical care for the issues that they have um, that are not related to COVID-19. And part of that is the concerns that we have been putting in all of this preparation around um, being able to care for people who do have this disease. It is safe to go to the hospital. And I want to reassure people that if you have diagnostic tests that have been booked, that you've been waiting for, it is safe to go for those. It is safe to call 911. If you need that urgent medical care, do not hesitate to call for help if you need it. As well, we want to make sure that we are doing our best to protect people in our community from all of the other issues that arise um, that may affect our health. In particular, we, I want to encourage people of young children, parents of young children, to make sure that they continue with their childhood immunization programs. These are critical programs that we are preserving within our public health communities to make sure that, that young children in particular receive their basic immunizations and their childhood immunizations. So please um, be reassured that these services are still available to you and it is still incredibly important to protect our children from the other infectious diseases that we know can spread in our communities. And finally, we have been receiving and I've been talking a lot about uh, the importance of us being kind and supporting each other. We are in this together and we are in the midst of it still. We'll be presenting some of the modeling about where we are in the midst of it and some of the thinking that we have about going forward. But we are not at the point yet where we can let up and I know that is very challenging for people. And we've heard some anecdotes mostly of people getting frustrated and angry and I think we have to realize that this is often a manifestation of anxiety and fear that we have, not knowing about the future, not knowing what's going to happen with our jobs, not knowing what's going to happen with our families, being affected by not being able to see our loved ones. And I, um, this is a time where we really need to stand together to support each other, to respond to anger with kindness to make sure that we can support each other as we go through the coming weeks and months because we are all in this together. What we do today and what we do every day through this really matters. We are all making a difference and we are um, getting through this together. We are supporting our healthcare workers, we're supporting people who are caring for this virus and we need to continue to support each other in our communities to make it through this. We need to be kind and we need to be calm and to help each other and stay safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And uh, I wanted to start by, by joining uh, Dr. Henry in expressing our condolences to the families of those who have passed away from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. One, as Dr. Henry has said, in, in the Interior Health Authority, one in Vancouver Coastal Health and one in Fraser Health. These are uh, significant losses. We understand uh, families will be grieving, and I think uh, they tell us in the most profound way possible why we do have to be kind and pull together because um, there are some people who uh, uh, are either directly or uh, through a family member or from taking care of someone. Uh, associated with that grieving and and I want uh, everybody to know that uh, we not only extend our condolences we um, uh, both uh, Dr. Henry and I um, reflect on it every single day before we come down here the cost of this for many individuals who have lost loved ones so far and uh, I wanted to note that um, as we do to talk about the acute care sector uh, 131 people in, in acute care hospitals today, of which uh, 68 are in Fraser Health, 11 in Interior Health, 9 in, on Vancouver Island, 4 in the Northern Health Authority, and 39 in Vancouver Coastal Health. That we have 4,632 uh, vacant hospital beds. That's a capacity level closer to 59%, uh, close to 59%. And then in critical care units, we have an occupancy rate of 46.3%. Wanted to add to the data I gave about surgeries yesterday that um, there was one data point missing from one health authority. In fact, we've completed in the period in question, which was March 16th, April 12th, 9,552 
um, urgent and emergency surgeries, so urgent elective and emergency surgery. And so that we've, can well, we've canceled uh, uh, many surgeries that are elective surgeries. There continues to be work done in our healthcare system. Equally, yesterday there were 3,595 emergency room visits across BC. This compares to 6,559 on March 9th, so it's significantly under. And it reinforces um, what Dr. Henry has just said to you, which uh, uh, statistically, which is that um, it is safe to go to the hospital and there will be there people there to help you if you have uh, conditions or need to. Uh, to either do a diagnostic test or uh, receive care, emergency care in our health care system. So that's an important point to recognize. The work continues in long-term care and I just wanted to, to reach out to everyone again who works in long-term care. Um, there were, as, as we've said, no, f no further deaths in long-term care, but we continue to face a significant issues around long-term care and not just issues around people with COVID-19, we understand, I think, very much the impact um, in a personal way, but also uh, in looking at the changes that have been made to protect people, the consequences of that. People do uh, pass away from things other than COVID-19 and long-term care. And one would hope that they would be surrounded, of course, in those times by family members, and that is not always possible now. And so we want everybody to understand that there is a cost to these measures and while the measures, I think, are absolutely necessary, and the evidence shows they're absolutely necessary, and they're some of the strongest that have been taken anywhere, uh, we understand with all measures that are taken to protect people that they are not without cost. And we wanted to reach out, and I particularly want to reach out to all the families of people who have relatives, loved ones, friends in long-term care, that we understand how difficult this time is. I also want to acknowledge all of the health sciences professionals that are working uh, uh, across the system. We think of respiratory therapists, but so many more across health sciences professions who are doing remarkable work in supporting people both with COVID-19 and acute care and other patients in what is a very difficult time. I want to let people know over the next week there are going to be five uh, uh, virtual down uh, town halls, one in each health authority. They'll be hosted by uh, members of the legislature from the uh, the uh, NDP and from the opposition, each each will have a co-host and each will involve with the CEOs of the health authorities and the medical officers of health. The first one will be Friday, April 17th in Vancouver Coastal Health and when it will involve Mary Ackenhusen, Dr. Pat Patricia Daly, Bowen Ma MLA and John Yap MLA and there will be more, um, more, such, um, more such town halls coming up and I just wanted to express my appreciation to uh, my colleague in the legislature, Norm Letnick, whose idea this was originally and we've worked uh, together on this idea. I think it's very important that people, we have an opportunity and especially in regions for the people who are um, leading our efforts in these regions, the CEOs of health authorities and medical health officers to be able to answer directly questions that people in regions have. We also want to acknowledge the work that essential service providers have done to find new ways of delivering their services safely. As an example, financial institutions have made online and telephone services more available and we encourage you to make use of these virtual storefronts and while some transactions obviously require people to come in branch, we ask that, we ask that everybody apply the same diligence as you would to trips to the grocery store and keep um, them to a minimum. And I also want to acknowledge and uh, all the people, all people with disabilities in the province and so that they, they understand that uh, that services and supports will be there for them if they require acute care services related to COVID-19, that their concerns are, are of significant importance both to uh, people who work with people with disabilities every day and to the healthcare system in what's a difficult time and that we are focused on their, their concerns and sometimes their circumstances which require, um, uh, require special treatment. For example, uh, the need to ensure in hospitals for people who have uh, hearing or sight disabilities may have more need for support in hospital from people who are regularly there to support them and we are absolutely working on all of those questions. On Friday we'll be presenting modeling and I wanted to just say uh, finally just a word about that. Uh, we won't be uh, doing a briefing tomorrow but we will be providing all of the information that you have come to that you come to expect every day with respect to new cases but with respect to modeling I want to say this that what we're trying to do and what we've tried to do from the beginning is why we were the first 
uh, province to present uh, modeling why uh, Dr. Henry and the De Deputy Minister Stephen Brown gave a detailed technical briefing some weeks ago and why we're updating it now. We want everyone to understand and see what we're seeing. This is not a turning point day. There isn't major changes coming out of what we do Friday. It's just our continuing effort to ensure, as I said, that you see what we see. And what we see is people around British Columbia who are taking part, who are participating, who are all in, who are helping to bend the curve. And now more than ever, as we see, I think, some positive indications about that and some challenges. You look at the mission institution, you look at other circumstances around the province and you see what can happen um, uh, in, uh, in circumstances and in communities of people uh, when COVID-19 is present. So we have to continue to, our work continue to be 100% all in. But I want to acknowledge every person in the province who have been part of this effort that uh, Dr. Henry and Mr. Brown and so many others have led running the modeling and to acknowledge that you, when we do models and we present what the circumstances are in BC, we see your effort, your commitment, your work, and yes, your sacrifice. And if anything, what we need to do as this is working to a degree is to continue to be 100% all in in this effort in British Columbia. And I wanted to thank everybody out there for that. Je vais dire quelques mots en français. Uh, uh, je vais trouver mon français de première main et puis de dire que de signal qu'il y a 44 nouveaux cas uh, ont été testés positifs dans la province au cours des dernières 24 heures, ce qui porte notre total à 1561. Cela comprend 670 à Vancouver Coastal, 623 à Fraser Health, 92 sur l'île de Vancouver, 146 dans l'intérieur et 30 au nord. Nous avons maintenant 5, uh, 5, uh, 955 personnes qui se sont complètement rétablies en Colombie-Britannique. Je voudrais me joindre au Dr. Henry pour exprimer mes condoléances aux familles des trois personnes décédées au cours des dernières 24 heures de COVID-19 en Colombie-Britannique. Les, euh, 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 les trois, je pense, euh, et leurs familles, les familles de ces trois personnes, euh, pour eux, c'est une situation douloureuse. C'est douloureux pour nous aussi. Et nous voulons présenter et exprimer nos condoléances. Um, je pense que uh, je veux uh, uh, ajouter qu'il y a aujourd'hui 131 personnes hospitalisées avec COVID-19 en Colombie-Britannique. C'est 68 à Fraser, 11 dans l'intérieur, 9 sur l'île de Vancouver, uh, uh, 4 au nord et 39 à Vancouver Coastal. Et quand on uh, regarde notre secteur des soins, uh, et, so, il y a 4632 uh, lits qui sont actuellement vides. Uh, uh, cela signifie un taux d'occupation de uh, 58,8% dans l'ensemble du système et de 47,3% dans les lits de soins intensifs en Colombie-Britannique. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. Good afternoon. Safe Care BC has released a survey of its members, almost 500 in long-term care and assisted living facilities. Uh, Seventy percent say they are experiencing a critical shortage of personal protective equipment, N95 masks, eye protection equipment, and so on. Um, first of all, I guess, are you aware of this concern, and is it going to be addressed? Absolutely, and yeah, that is an issue that we've been working on, as you know, uh, for some time. I will note that this survey was done a few weeks ago um, at a time when um, PPE was less uh, was continually tenuous in our supplies. I will also note that uh, some of it refers to things like respirators, and there is not a great use for respirators in long-term care, for example, and they need to be preserved. So N95s, for example, are respirators, and they're used for um, aerosol-generating medical procedures, things that we don't, um, that we avoid avoid doing in uh, long-term care. So the focus is on what is the appropriate personal protective equipment
equipment? How is it to be used? And we do know that many people in long-term care um, are, are not as familiar with using personal protective equipment for interactions with the residents in their home. So that has been a transition. Uh, we are um, absolutely working in every long-term care facility in our province to ensure that every encounter with a person, a patient, a resident in that facility is done safely. And that, for the most part, includes um, healthcare workers wearing a mask for those encounters and ensuring that we have access to masks, gloves, hand hygiene, and all the other important measures that help us reduce transmission in those settings. So very much working on this. Next question is from Andrew McLeod with the TAI. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, talked a bit in the past about what's needed to go back to normal. Uh, in the last couple of days, we had, uh, I think the European Union put out a 15-page document of, on guidelines of, of what's needed. Uh, World Health Organization had a six-point summary of things they, they thought jurisdictions should be looking for. California put out its own roadmap. Um, I'm wondering what you think of those approaches and when we might expect to see a similar roadmap for BC and what it would need to include in your view. So absolutely, I'm very familiar with them, particularly the WHO one that we've been involved with, um, um, and a number of ones, ECDC has a very good one, there are a number of others. Um, our special advisory committee nationally has been looking at this and addressing this issue about how do we make this relevant to where we are in our pandemic here in BC and across Canada. So we are at different places in different parts of the world and certainly in, even in different parts of Canada. So there are things in there that are very relevant and that we've talked about them. You know, how many cases we have, how much our healthcare system has capacity to contract or expand our PPE supply and how uh, secure we are with um, access to it in the longer term. Um, in the community, you know, how many, how um, secure we are with our testing capacity, which has been, as we have um, reported here in BC, we've increased our testing capacity. I think the other piece that's really important around our testing capacity is having access in all parts of the province. And once again, within BC, we're not at the same point in all parts of BC either. Um, and also the, you know, having access to a serology test that helps us understand um, who has been exposed and who has, or who has been infected and who has some immunity to this would help us guide our direction. So those are all the things that we are also considering and we are developing our roadmap both for how we will look at the healthcare sector, but also how we will look at measures that we need to continue and what we can lift within our community. So on Friday, we'll talk some more about where we are in our pandemic and how that might be reflected. And then in the coming weeks, um, the, the planning that we're doing now will be, um, will be available and we'll be sharing it with everybody as well. But I think it's really important to recognize that, that we are not at the end of our beginning yet. We're maybe um, partway through it. We're not at uh, anywhere near the end of what we're going to do with this. And normal is going to look quite different for some time. It's not going to be the same as what it is today, perhaps, but there are some measures that we are not going to be able to, to stop doing until we have enough immunity in our community what we call herd immunity in, in public health, uh, until we have enough to prevent transmission and prevent lots of people becoming sick in a very rapid way. So that is the important part. And part of that is understanding who has immunity already. And the other part of it is the ways that we increase community immunity is either from people being infected or and surviving or um, vaccine. So those are two really important pieces that we need to consider, and we'll be talking more about that on Friday. Nick Johansson, Castanet. Hi, Dr. Henry. With regards to this uh, first death in the interior health region, can you say what date this man passed away on? And you also said he was recovering at home when he passed. Uh, had he been in the hospital prior to his death? And how long before he died was he released from the hospital? Uh, yeah, I don't have all the, the details. Um, um, this gentleman unfortunately died. Uh, we were notified of it in the statistics today. Uh, so yesterday uh, was when the, the death was notified. Um, I will tell you that he, he was mostly at home, but had been um, 
had gone into the hospital uh, with an acute condition just prior to his death. Rashmi Nair, CBC. Hi there, um, Dr. Henry and Minister Dick. Hi, um, how concerned are you about the proposed transit cut that TransLink is warning about? Like even prior to the call for emergency funding, how far and other essential workers were already saying that the reduced service was leading to overcrowding on some buses. So what can you say about that one? So I, my perspective, of course, is making sure that we have guidance that TransLink is following that um, allows us to continue this essential service. And it is absolutely an essential service for many people, for those who live on the main, uh, the lower mainland, for example, um, healthcare workers, is to be able to get to work to do the things that we need. So my um, uh, important piece of this is ensuring that we have the appropriate guidance and that they're able to manage that. Um, and uh, I'll leave uh, Minister Dix to talk about the money. Obviously, TransLink is uh, a very essential service for those of us who are responsible for health care. It's important for many people in health care to get to work, to get to uh, long-term care homes that they work uh, they work in or assisted living or in the community or at a hospital. So uh, the transit is obviously a very important thing. I know these issues are being worked on between uh, TransLink and the appropriate ministries, different, and there's work going on everywhere because, as all of you know, um, the impact of COVID-19 on, on all governments, on the economy, on people is profound. So uh, this is one area where it's significant. We hear from uh, municipalities. Um, we also hear from lots of people who are struggling and uh, certainly uh, in my community of Vancouver Kingsway I hear lots of that as well. So I think you're going to hear more about these issues. Nobody disputes, absolutely nobody disputes the central importance of people being able to get around and get to essential work uh, in the community. And I know that lots of people are working to see, uh, to see that that continues. Cindy Harnett, Times Colonist. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, with regard to the single site order for healthcare um, staff in long-term care, what is your expectation for when all homes uh, should have this implemented? Would that be summer or at least before uh, a possible second wave? And can you explain why group homes aren't included or is that um, something that you know, you're thinking about? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll address the second part. I mean, group homes tend to be smaller. Um, there's uh, smaller numbers of people, and the workers who work in group homes are somewhat different um, than the, the people who are working in long-term care, the healthcare workers in our, our long-term care sector. So um, we have been looking at the important part of how we support workers um, who do work in, in our group homes and how we best protect people in that sector across the province. Um, but with respect respect to, to long-term care and assisted living facilities and uh, our acute care facilities. It is a, a, a complicated process in the Lower Mainland in particular with between Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health to work it all out, but I know it is ongoing. So I do expect it will be substantially implemented within the next week to two weeks. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time for all the dust to settle, but I know that as well here on in Island Health where there is fewer people who are um, involved and in the interior in the north, uh, it's moving ahead as well. So I do expect that it'll be substantially complete within the, the coming weeks. Next question is from David Molko, CTV. Hi, Dr. Henry. I just wanted to ask you about community deaths again, and I, I understand that the death in the interior is not technically a community death, but when we talk about people um, sort of enduring their symptoms and, and, and working through them at home, um, in the last community death, the, the one in Richmond, you talked about how you were going to look back at the process, at the monitoring, at the reaching out you were doing uh, at that point to see what changes could be made. And I'm just curious to know, what have you learned? What, what changes have been made in the last week or so? 
Yeah, so we focused a little bit more, at, well, we focused more attention on um, assessing people's symptoms during the second week of illness. We've come to recognize, and this is not a, a surprise having lived through SARS a, a number of years ago, but um, people who have a, apparently a mild illness early on, it's a critical period of time around day five, day six, day seven, where they either start to really get better and uh, shrug it off, or some people can very quickly go downhill. And uh, that is a, a critical period of time where we're having a, a more contact with people. We're making sure that if they are, are having any experience of shortness of breath or chest pain or other things that might come with um, having an infection that affects both the lungs and other parts of the body, that they are, we have a low threshold for bringing them into hospital, at least for observation, where they can be closer to critical care if needed. So that's one of the things. The other one is we're making sure our elderly algorithms for who can safely um, recover at home uh, cover things like, uh, you know, we've always known that as you get older, your chances of having um, a more severe illness go up, but also covering things like people who have underlying illnesses that might make them at more risk and making sure that we have ongoing connections to make sure that if there's any concern at all that somebody might be not getting better or have concerns that they're, they um, call 811, that we have the ability to get them into a facility um, much quicker just in case. Keith Baldry, Global News. <clears throat> Regarding the, the outbreak admission, uh, people are being released from prison all the time, I assume. Uh, I don't know how many, but given that's a cluster and they're all living close together, is there any efforts made to track people uh, when they leave pr that facility, where they go? Are they required to self-isolate? And also when you say the new normal is going to look a lot different for a long time, are you referring to that social distancing will be here for a long time? Um, in terms of mission, yes, um, we have um, reiterated our expectations and are working with Correctional Services Canada to be sure that when people are released, and as you say, they can be released uh, quite quickly into our community, the expectation in BC is that when you have been in an outbreak situation like that, that you will self-isolate for 14 days. And we have had um, people who have been uh, released from uh, correctional facilities that have developed illness in the community. So we are going to be actively supporting people who are released from mission, who are staying in BC to make sure that we uh, that they can safely self-isolate and that they have the provisions they need and that they have the follow-up they need in case they do become ill in that um, critical incubation period. So that is one of the things that we're developing the protocols or have developed protocols with correctional services on. Um, in terms of yeah, the the new the new normal, the for now normal, some of the things that we'll be thinking about are that physical distancing. We do know that these are the things that help prevent transmission. Things like cleaning our hands regularly. So you will see us talking about that um, continually for the next while because that's an important thing that we know works to protect ourselves. The concept of covering our cough, of uh, keeping that distance. So maybe it's um, in a workplace where you um, divide people up so you don't have as much crowding in your workplace. You're not all in there at the one time. Um, you continue to have a, a mix of working at home but having physical distancing when you are um, in the office perhaps. Or not having the meetings the way we used to have, getting used to some combinations of virtual virtual meetings and in-person meetings when you can maintain those safe distances. Enhance cleaning in our environment. Um, I don't feel, I don't believe that there's going to be any changes to our uh, way we're grocery shopping or going to the pharmacy in the near future. We'll need to keep those distances, for those safe distances between us for some time. Chella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry. I was going to ask you to elaborate on that because I know that on Friday you're going to be giving us more projections about what we can expect, but can you give us any idea as to what kind of safeguards you would like to see in place as someone who has gone through SARS when we're hearing that the wet markets in China are going to be allowed to reopen, things that have made people very concerned in recent weeks about what the source of this particular virus may have been? What are you hoping um, evolves from this situation? 
Yeah, although well, some of the, uh, the the sort of bigger uh, international questions, uh, you know, those are challenging ones, and and I I do um, have great concerns about things going back to so-called normal um, when we know the the amount of destruction and um, suffering that this has caused around the world, and I can't. I, I I can't even begin to think that we would allow um, that sort of uh, of uh, return to a, a practice that puts people at risk again. And it's not only putting the rest of the world at risk, but putting um, people in those communities and in China, for example, at risk too. We are not yet through this pandemic, um, either here in BC, in Canada, or globally. And there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to understand how we can get through this safely. Um, so here in BC, we'll be looking at making sure we have our, our uh, that we continue to have our, our safe distance measures in place, our hand washing, those things that I just mentioned. And how can we reopen those critical services that we need in our community, those businesses, our economics, without losing um, that, uh, that safety distance? Um, but also connect our communities again and continue to connect in communities. We'll also be looking at the health system. So how do we restart those pieces of the health system that we have put on hold for a while, but do it in a way that's safe? And part of that will mean having the, the adequate testing that we need in our community, and we're getting there with that. Having things like serologic testing to help support us in investigation. Having public health on the ground to um, investigate every single case and make Make sure that we um, stop those chains of transmission so we don't get explosive outbreaks like we've seen in other parts of the world. So those are the critical things we need to find that balance, um, the balance between opening up, letting us get back to some of the important things that we have in our lives, including our health system, but being prepared that if we start to see cases, we start to see a surge again, we're able to manage that effectively and protect people, um, both who have the disease and those who, um, who are in our communities that um, Need healthcare for other reasons, so uh, it's uh, you know the details are, are are things we're working out right now, um, but it's going to be a fine balance and it's going to be a learning experience. We're learning from watching what others are doing, who are farther ahead of us in in their trajectory, and we'll continue to follow that um, over the coming weeks. Les Lane, Times Colonist. Oh, thank. The Premier was talking earlier about uh, discussions and planning for a possible kind of staged resumption of activities in the not too distant future. Does the extension of the state of emergency for two more weeks today um, suggest that you're going to stand pat and hold the line for at least that period of time? The short answer is absolutely. We've said before, and we'll continue to say, you know, uh, what we're thinking about is at the, you know, after the end of April, um, we don't, I don't see any, foresee any changes to what we're doing in the, in the coming two weeks, three weeks. But in the meantime, we're still planning for what we can do um, once we start to get to that point where, where we're tipping over the edge, where the curve is not just flat, but it's come down. Um, we're not there yet. We still need to hold the line. Really importantly, we need to hold the line for the coming weeks here in British Columbia. We are doing okay. And we're seeing that in the fact that people get the health care that they need. People are able to, to manage in our communities. And that's why it is so important for us to, to be patient right now, to be kind to each other, because it is going to be some weeks before we can let up even a little bit. I don't know if you want to talk about yeah, that as well. I mean, the answer to the question is, is yes, Les. I think uh, I said, Dr. Henry said some weeks ago that there wouldn't be, there was zero chance of any changes of these, of this direction in the month of April. I think that continues to be true. We have to do the work. This is an unprecedented situation in our lifetimes, I think it's fair to say. And so there's lots of work to be done. And what it says to us, though, when so many people have sacrificed so much, sometimes by choice, sometimes not by choice, that we really have to be 100% all in now. We have to continue to do what we've been doing. We continue to hold the line, as Dr. Henry says, Let's continue to bend the curve. But this is critically important in the coming weeks uh, because what we need to do 
is organized in a planned way into the future. But to do that, we have to flatten the curve now. And so those actions need to continue as we show the results of those tremendous efforts by people in British Columbia and all of those sacrifices and, and what we can do in the future. So uh, I think the answer to the question is pretty clearly yes. Next question is from Mary Brooke, West Shore Voice. Go ahead, Mary. Hi, thanks for taking my question. It's regarding seniors in the long-term care facilities. And so as we've heard, um, seniors who do come down with COVID in those scenarios are offered hospital care. And, but in many cases, or some cases, they're declining, which in a way kind of precludes their fate. So I'm just wondering if there is a plan to space out physically distance the people who live in these long-term care facilities, whether you can use some of that overflow space, say at the Vancouver Convention, Convention Center, to literally um, reduce the number of people in these facilities so they have a fighting chance. Yeah, so I, I think we need to, you know, put it in, in a bit of context in that um, we have had hundreds of cases of residents and, and, you know, that's an important thing. These are people's homes. So it's not as easy as, as moving people out into a, an unfamiliar place that we know can have um, challenges for people, particularly um, people who have dementia. So it's a, it's a very fine balance. We do try and find ways within the home um, to isolate people, particularly anybody who um, has illness is moved out. But I also will say there's most people who have this in long-term care, even elderly people have recovered from it. So, you know, that's, that's the positive thing. And there was a, a beautiful story last weekend of a, a 99-year-old man who had COVID-19 and, and he recovered from it. And there's quite a few of those stories. There's many of those stories. So it's not, um, it's not as um, grim. Unfortunately, you know, the chances of having severe disease and succumbing to it are very high, as we know. So yes, there are physical distancing things, measures being put in place in homes as best as possible, and uh, looking at how people can be um, uh, separated from others, particularly if they show any signs of illness. So that is something that is part of the outbreak protocol that we, um, we have in place in, in the long-term care facilities. So we have time for one more question today. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement released this afternoon with all the information covered off in today's press conference. For recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the provincial health officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question today. En français, Dominique Levesque, CBC Radio Canada. Oui, merci pour le ministre D. Euh, je voudrais que vous nous disiez en français à quoi on peut s'attendre vendredi matin avec les, les modèles et, et qu'est-ce que vous allez faire vendredi? Oui, nous allons euh, vous présenter les renseignements qu'on a, les modèles qu'on a. On va discuter de ce qu'on a. Uh, on a dit il y a trois semaines, ou presque trois semaines maintenant, les modèles présentés à, en, à ce moment-là et faire en comparaison de ce qui s'est passé, s'est déroulé depuis ces trois semaines. On va démontrer et présenter des résultats, uh, le progrès, en quelque sorte, qu'on a fait, l'effet des mesures qu'on a pris, et on va présenter cela au public pour que tout le monde sache ce que nous sachions. C'est le progrès de COVID-19 euh, en Colombie-Britannique et le progrès de nos mesures euh, en, en nous attaquant euh, à ce problème-là. Donc, on va, on va présenter tout cela. Ce n'est pas un moment, euh, disons, tournant. C'est un moment de renseignement. Nous avons présenté nos renseignements premièrement au Canada et maintenant, on va faire une... Euh, on va les mettre au présent, euh, c'est-à-dire de, de dire ce que, ce que s'est passé. Euh, on a présenté ces modèles en comparaison avec la situation en Italie, en Chine avant. Et maintenant, on va démontrer où on est euh, dans le progrès de COVID-19 en euh, Colombie-Britannique et en particulier le progrès de nos efforts de, le, de combattre COVID-19 en Colombie-Britannique. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.